right, New Testament. Buenos dias. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Happy August. Happy Jesus Day. Awesome stuff. It's good to be together. I think you noticed maybe coming in, we had some construction going on out there. And I know Jimmy mentioned it. How about Jimmy's little mustache there? Anybody seeing that? I caught him last night conditioning it. There's conditioner. I'm throwing him under the bus. So, so you can go and, and check that out today, the nice conditioning mustache. It's a good thing. Uh, yeah, so we are doing some changes here, and it's good. It's a sign of life. It's good to uh, change things up a little bit. And so uh, we are asking you to pray with us. In the next few weeks, we are going to be um, painting throughout the building, which is super exciting. Uh, team's been working on that. And then um, I think some Sunday I'm just going to take you on a tour of this sanctuary and point out every stain of coffee and juice and something maybe that Inside Out did all over the place. But we're going to be getting um, square carpet. So you can just just throw your coffee on the carpet now and we'll we'll just rip it up and replace it. And it's going to be great. So we are excited about that. And just what's happening, like, Aren't you just grateful for the presence of the Lord? It's just so evident this morning, and I love uh, what Dominic said there, that God is a God who responds. God is a God who responds, and that is some good stuff. So, New Testament, who here has ever had a nickname growing up? I think a nickname is a sign of affection and acceptance, and when I was growing up as a child one of my nicknames was bubbles and goldilocks and then maybe around uh junior high age okay my family is i inherited becoming a celtic fan because of my father and being irish and so i'm a celtic fan and when i was growing up the celtics used to be good they're starting to become good again but they were good and it was during the Larry Bird era okay so if you don't know your sports Larry Bird was the man he was Larry the legend okay and this guy could shoot and he would just like sacrifice his body across the court and so um, I think my mom was just trying to build me up and my initials my middle name is Beth so Lori Beth LB and Larry Bird like the two go together right like it's destined for greatness right here so my mom would call me Larry Bird or not Larry Bird Lori Bird right so I think maybe like eighth or ninth grade now I was into basketball my freshman year of high school I went to a school called Finney uh, it's a private school and I was new to this school but I was playing basketball and there's this kid he was a senior okay this is a big deal a senior talking to a freshman his name was Rashad and he started calling me Little Bird so all throughout high school, they called me Little Bird because, believe it or not, I could shoot. Like, I have no speed whatsoever, okay? And I'm the Crowleys have speed in their genes, but I could shoot. And so he called me Little Bird. And to me, that was like the best thing ever because Larry Bird is the man, and he's Larry the legend. There was a game in history, 1987, where the Celtics were playing, I believe it was the, let me check, yes, the Washington Bullets, where Larry Bird, like the clock is winding down, Larry Bird is behind the three-point line, and he shoots, he swishes, they should win the game, but the Celtics had called a timeout, so it didn't count. And so you watch the video of this game, and Larry Bird like literally crumples to the ground just like in frustration that the shot didn't count. So he goes to the timeout, and he tells his coach and his teammates, give me the ball in the exact same spot. True story. So, timeout's over. Game begins. Larry Bird, Larry the legend, right here. Larry Bird gets that ball in the exact same spot, and this time, no lie, off of one foot, swishes it, wins the game, Larry Legend, let's go, Lori Bird right here. I know. <laughs> this is what dreams are made of. And I tell you all of that because you were very gracious to listen to us last week about Camp Shiloh, and our theme at Camp Shiloh was legendary. And I want to talk about that a little bit for here at New Testament. This was our theme verse. The man who conditions his mustache actually came up with this theme himself for our camp. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found. 
may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I had the privilege at Camp Shiloh Friday night to share with our senior campers, and I was talking about what it means to be legendary, because to be legendary, it involves time. Larry Bird didn't just become a legend after making that one shot. It like spanned his career that he was doing something. So, so being legendary involves time and an endurance of time, but there's also something to show for you. There's some action involved. He wouldn't have been Larry the legend if he wasn't making these shots and doing what he did. So it involves time and it involves action that there's something to show for it. Now, we all want to be known for something. Wouldn't it be awesome if we were known for our walk with the Lord? Wouldn't that be awesome if we were known for our walk with the Lord? That we were known for our faith? Because because your faith, New Testament, is meant to be used. Your faith is to be put into action. It's meant to be used. And so... I'm not sure if you noticed this. It took me quite a while, but I'm driving down Ridge Road one afternoon, and uh, all of a sudden, I noticed, this is back a couple months ago, Brugger's Bagels is closed on Ridge Road. Like that plaza where Subway and Kobe Sushi, if you're ever looking for sushi, Kobe Sushi, good stuff, Ridge Road. But there used to be a Brugger's right there, and I just, I think it was closed for months before I noticed. Now, partly because it doesn't affect me. I don't really go buy bagels. But it had been closed for months before I noticed, like, whoa, where did the bagel place go? And it got me thinking about my life, and it actually got me thinking about New Testament. What about this place? For God forbid someday we were, would, would anybody notice that New Testament Christian Church wasn't here? Does anybody even, we are here, do people in our community notice that New Testament Christian church exists. It's kind of a sobering thought. It's kind of an eye-opening thought. Do people in my community know that my church exists? And so I want to I take you through a few things this morning. But first, I want to take you through um, a very common, well-known scripture in the Bible called the Great Commission. Jesus' last words, okay? You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four disciples, they all share their perspective of Jesus living here on earth, and they all share what Jesus said and did here on earth, and so they all share Jesus' last words, and each of them say pretty much the same thing, yet different, because they're coming from a different perspective. And so I want to look at that for a moment. Matthew chapter 28, this is the last words of Jesus here on earth. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. Not sit. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Every nook and cranny, Jesus said, go. Now, as soon as I read that, I was reminded yesterday, Michelle Heed, one of our missionaries in Africa, called me. I've never had a call from Africa. I ignored it because I didn't know the number. It looked like one of those solicitors, and they kept calling and calling, and then I got a text, can you please answer my phone call? I was like, oh, hey, didn't know it was you. But last week, we prayed for her daughter, who was super, super, super sick. And she said, Olivia is better. She woke up. She ate. She's doing awesome. And she's like, it was literally a miracle. Like, they were super scared. And so, amen to Jesus. We prayed. Others were praying. She is good. So all glory to Jesus there. All the nations. Awesome. Thank you for praying. So that was Matthew. Then Mark gives his take on Jesus's last words, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So it's pretty similar. Then he goes on to talk about the signs that are going to follow you. 
You're going to cast out demons. You're going to speak in new tongues. You're not going to be hurt. You're not going to be. Um, you're not going to become sick. There's not going to. You're not going to be defiled. In fact, you're going to lay hands on people and they're going to recover. You're going to see miracles. This is Mark's perspective. And then we flip to Luke. And here he gives Jesus' last words. Verse 47, that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now here, his perspective is, he he heard Jesus say, wait for my power before you go. And we see that happen in Acts. They waited for the power, and we read about it in Acts chapter 2, where this is like supernatural church on steroids, okay? Like the Acts church was awesome. And so you see like thousands of people getting saved, and there's unity, and there's supernatural favor, and people are sharing stuff with each other, and there's joy, and all this stuff is happening, and you can't have that Acts chapter 2 church without first being an Acts chapter 1 church. They waited in the presence of the Lord. And they waited for his power to come. They spent time with Jesus, and then they did something with it. They spent time with Jesus, and then they did something with it. And then John, uh, he pretty much says, uh, Jesus' last words were, you, follow me. You, follow me. And if you sum all of that up between the four guys, you know what Jesus is saying? Do something with your faith. Follow me and then help others follow me. Do something with your faith. Make an impact. Disciple people. Invest into people. Be a vessel for miracles to work through. Be a vessel for my power to work through. Do something with your faith is what Jesus is saying because your faith is meant to be used. Your faith is meant to be used. Why? Because the heart of Jesus is that every person might know his love. The heart of Jesus is that every person might be transformed. Not just the ones that look like us, not just the ones that uh, act like us, not just the ones that, oh, you smell really good. It's not just for you, and it's not just about you. He said, go into all the world. Preach to every person. Get out of your seat. Throw the covers off. Put your faith into action. Take what you have. Take what you've experienced. Take what you've seen. Take what you've heard. Take what you've received and share it and give it and reveal it to other people to help other people know Jesus. Bring it. Share it with others. So back in July, I uh, brought a seatbelt buckle to church, and since I bought one, I figured I'd better use it again to be a wise steward of my money. So I brought it back because our mission here at New Testament is about connecting people to God. And um, I just really like that. Click so everybody clap for a second. Yeah. See that right there? One more time. Right here. Everybody clap. Get that click? That's what I envision when we say connecting people to God. Just that little right there. Connecting people to God. That is our mission here at New Testament. Connecting people to God by pursuing his presence. Connecting people to God by encountering his power. Connecting people to God by seeing his promises fulfilled. This is why we exist, to connect people to God. And so Jesus promised his presence as we gather. He promised his presence as we gather. But he he promised his power as we spread out. His power
power was promised in the context of mission. Wait until it comes and go. You will be, re- you will be, you will, power will come from on high. Wait for it, receive it, and go. It was promised in the context of mission because the Holy Spirit comes in us. It's the same spirit that raises Jesus from the dead that dwells in us. The Holy Spirit is in us, and it's the Holy Spirit that recreates us and transforms us and gives us new birth and restores us and brings us to a better place. And, and like that's the Holy Spirit in us. But the Holy Spirit also comes on us. We read about that all throughout the Bible. Old and new, the Holy Spirit came on to complete a mission. And so the Holy Spirit comes on us, this is fun, to get what is in us, out of us, to those around us. Okay? So New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes on us to get what is in you, out of you, to those around us. Because Jesus said, go. Because Jesus said, go. Because Jesus said, let's get out of our seats and go and do something with our faith. We carry his presence for the sake of other people. And so we have his spirit with us. We have his spirit in us. We have his spirit on us in order for God to use us. And and if you are anything like me, I am well aware we are limited. We are naturally limited by many things. We're limited by time. We're limited by resources. We're limited by desire. We're limited by our apathy. I just don't want it. We're limited by our fears. We're limited by our doubt and our unbelief. We're limited by our insecurities. There's all these things that limit us. We're limited by our excuses that we uh, use to justify ourselves. We're limited by all these th- different things, but, je- but yet Jesus created us, Jesus created you to live outside of your natural limitations. Jesus created you to live outside of your natural limitations. You are not created just to work your job. You are not created just for binging on Netflix. You are not just created for your video game marathons. You are not just created for those shopping shopping sprees. You are not just created for all of that other stuff. God gave you his spirit to touch lives. You were created to be used by God to touch other people because of the spirit that is in you. And so I have to sometimes ask myself. So let's ask ourselves. Ask yourself, how have I limited myself? How have I limited myself? I just don't want to. You know, like I think of when you tell a kid they got to go apologize. Right? Like that's exactly what I, I, I just don't want to. Just not gonna. How how have we limited ourselves? I don't want to. I can't. Like that's that's legit, right? Like I I just I I really have no clue right now. I can't. We've limited ourselves. A lot of times in our thinking. But how have we also limited God? How have we limited God? Because we can't see it? Because we don't know how? How have we limited God? There's a really, um, there's, this, there's a scripture I found myself reading a couple months ago that we're going to look at today. That when I read it, uh, it just, it just, I just, I just can't get away from it. And this scripture uh, was very, it's a very popular scripture back in the 2000s. A book was written about it, The Prayer of Jabez, and it was like this big popular thing in church world. And so I'm reading it, and I'm like, I don't want to talk about this because, because it was such a popular thing. But God just kept speaking to me through this scripture. It's found in First Chronicles chapter 4. And this is the prayer of Jabez. Now, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that it may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. Two verses. Jabez, his name means pain. 
Like his mom named him pain. You have caused me pain. You're a pain in the butt. She named him pain. Literally, that is the name of this guy, Jabez. And despite what was spoken over him all of his life, despite what was trying to define him, Jabez recognizes the only way to break out of this is to call on the name of God. He recognizes who God is, and he starts looking to God to redefine his life, to redefine his destiny. To redefine his purpose, Jabez is literally saying, pain is not going to define me anymore. Pain is not going to be my identity. I want to accomplish the plans, the purposes of God in my life. I will, be not, I will not be known by pain. And so he prays a prayer. This prayer is not a formula. This prayer, as I read it, To me, this prayer is that heart-wrenching, from the gut, ugly tears. Ever cried ugly tears? This is that prayer that is coming from the depths of this man's soul, where he is like, I am no longer going to be limited. I am going to move forward in God. Take me, God. Use me, God. This is in my heart, God. This is the kind of prayer Jabez prayed. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Now that's a great prayer right there. Thank you, Jesus. We all want to be blessed. I would love a pickup truck and probably some new shoes because somebody showed me their shoes yesterday, so now I want a pair of shoes. And I would love to be blessed with, um, you know, you have your list. Sometimes we like to go to God as like a vending machine. It's what you do, God. (laughs) That's not the prayer that Jabez is praying. Oh, that you would bless me. It was a cry of humility from a man that literally was like, I can't do this without you, God. I need your blessing on my life, God, in order to do anything for you. This was a prayer that said, would you bless me, Father? Would you bless me, God? I can't do it any other way. You tell me what the blessing is. You pick what it is, but I need your favor. I need your hand on my life. This was why he was asking God for a prayer. I can't do it without you, God. I need your supernatural favor to move forward. Oh, that you would bless me indeed, that you would enlarge my territory. Now, the fact that he said my territory means he already has something, he already owns something. You know, the Bible, it's a very biblical principle that when you're faithful with the little, with what you've been given, guess what's going to happen? faithful what you have. So now now we automatically know about Jabez. We already read that he's honorable. It said that. He's humble. He's a good steward. It's a pretty good quality to have. It says, enlarge my territory. Enlarge my territory. The cry of his heart was to be enlarged for the glory of God. Enlarge my territory. Enlarge my sphere. Enlarge my influence. Enlarge my vision. Enlarge me, Jesus, so that you can be glorified. It's literally an evangelistic cry. Enlarge me. Enlarge my territory for you so that all will know, so that you are glorified. Enlarge my opportunity to make a mark. Enlarge my opportunity to make an impact. Enlarge me. Enlarge my vision. Enlarge me. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. And enlarge my territory. That your hand would be with me. That simply tells us he values the presence of the Lord. Moses said the same thing in Exodus. We're not going unless he goes with us. We're not doing it, New Testament. Good stuff. We're not doing it unless God 
is with us and God goes with us. We're not doing it without him. And so Jabez prays the cry of his heart that your hand would be with me. I want to be close to you, God. I want to be dependent on you, God. I want to be near you. I want to be intimate with you. I want to be in close fellowship with you, that your hand would be with me. Please, God, I want more of you. I want to be close with you. This is the cry of his heart, that your hand would be with me. And that you would keep me from evil so that I wouldn't cause pain. Redefine my destiny, God. In fact, redefine my destiny, but his heart's cry is, I want to end well. So I won't cause, I want to end well. I don't want to end empty. I don't want to end defeated. I don't want to end Bitter, offended, fatigued, large character, your hand would be with me. He prays this. Do you know what happens at the end? God granted him what he requested. Yes. God granted him what he requested. This is literally... Literally all we know about Jabez, two verses in the midst of begat, in the midst of so-and-so begat this person, this was the son. Two verses in the midst of this is this heart-wrenching prayer where God changed the destiny. God changed the influence of Jabez. God enlarged him because he asked big, because he had faith because he had a heart for God's kingdom because he wasn't content spiritually and believed that there was more the cry of his heart I want all that you have for me God I want all that you have for me because there is more to this life than what I see right now I want all that you have for me, God, because I carry your presence for the sake of others. I want all that you enlarge my territory. And so as I read that and as I've reread it, that enlarge my territory. This is a prayer that just resonates in my heart right now. For myself, but for New Testament Christian Church. Enlarge our territory. This is a prayer that shows passion, it shows heart, it shows compassion. This is what we value here. We care about people, and we care about people knowing Jesus. That's our value, but do we really? Are our actions showing that? Is my actions showing that? Is my heart showing that? That we value people. Do we portray that? Because this is not NTCCC. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. This is not the Christian Country Club. (laughs) This is the church. And the church was meant to move forward and advance the kingdom of God here on earth. That's the heart of this prayer. It has an evangelistic nature to it. Enlarge our territory. it's, It's a prayer of willingness, but it's a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of surrender. Enlarge my territory so that you can use me to reveal you to other people, to extend your kingdom. So just like the prophet Isaiah said, here am I. Pick me. Send me. Use me. It's a prayer of surrender. So God, do what you got to do in my heart. Change me. Change the way I do things. Change my habits. Change my thinking. Change me in order to use me, in order to enlarge my territory. Change my desires. Change me. It's a, it's a prayer of surrender. Change me to enlarge me. It has heart. It has surrender in it. And it's a prayer of action. 
we sing this song. It has, it's been a while, like that ocean song, like I'll call upon your name and walk in the water. And every time we sing it, it's like so great, right? But I'm like, do we know what we're singing in the New Testament? You know, like it's going to make us move in faith. And that's this prayer. Do you know what you're praying? Because if you're going to pray it, 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 it requires some action. Like, am I willing to take those steps that Jesus asks me to take? It's going to take some action, a willingness, obedience to live, to serve, to give, to go, to sacrifice, to invest. Just go, pray, pray. If you're not willing to go there, I'm just warning you. There's a story in the Bible about Caleb and Joshua. These are guys that went and spied, you know, like, they spied the promised land. They went to the promised land to spy it out and kind of see. And they came back with a bunch of other guys to report it. And everybody else said, we can't do it. I mean, it's really good. But. And the Bible says that Caleb and Joshua were the only ones that said, we can do this. God is with us. And the Bible says, the Bible says there was a different spirit about them. There was a different spirit about them that said, we can do this. Let's go. Guess what, New Testament? We can do this for Jesus. Let's go. It's going to require action. Enlarge our territory. It's a prayer that's uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable prayer for sure. It's an uncomfortable prayer because uh, this is not going to keep you in your comfort zone. But that's okay because this is how we grow. Things that stretch us grow us. And oftentimes we uh, get stagnant when we are comfortable. But when we are put out of our comfort zone, when we have to kind of push through some opposition, when we have to even push through some of the fears that are trying to keep us, that's where you're going to get the breakthrough. That's where we grow. We can't make Jesus' last commandment our first priority if we're not willing to step out of our comfort zone. We can't make Jesus' last commandment our priority if we're not willing to break out of our bubble, if we're not willing to get out of our seat, if we're not willing to throw off the covers. It's a prayer that is not comfortable. But the kingdom of God is about advancing, is about moving forward. The Bible says that God wants to take us from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from victory to victory. Enlarge our territory, Jesus. This is what legends are made that you may be found to praise, glory, and honor Jesus. Now, when I was 13, can I borrow a chair just from here? When I was, whoa, sorry. When I was 13, I used to, um, maybe 13, I don't know. My uncle used to put me to work. He had a, uh, I don't know, I guess he flipped houses. And then, for whatever reason, he let me come along on, like, summers and breaks and whatnot. And it's the way I earned money, and it's the way I got to basketball camp. So parents make their kids work some, for, some, for their money to do stuff. Then he'd come like me, and it'll be great. Your kid would be better off. You're supposed to laugh at that. Thank you. I'm just joking. <laughs> kind of. But I re- so my uncle used to, I don't know, I would mow lawns and do, do stupid stuff that I could handle because clearly I'm not a fix-it person now, and I wasn't a fix-it person then. But I remember going to this one house where literally the uh, living room was, like, full of this house. I don't know how long they had sat abandoned, but the uh, living room was full of clothes that had been sitting there for God knows how long and animal feces and, like, up to my knees. And I remember the smell of the fish tank that had been, like, sitting in that place for so long, like, gagged me with a spoon. So this is some of the stuff that I got to do to earn money. Awesome. So I remember this one time. Um, I don't know if I'd been staying at their house or not, but he told me he had something for me. I think my family was there, but I just remember this. I remember sitting in this chair, and he told me to close my eyes. He had a prize for me or a surprise for me. Now, I make stuff up in my head, okay? Like, I can envision things, like, and make me think, like, it's going to happen. Like, I'm going to hit that three-point shot at the buzzer, even though my team never won a game, you know, my whole year, like, whatever. Like, I have in my head, like, it's going to happen. So for some reason, this must be around Easter. I don't know. I'm, like, 13. That was a long time ago. And I remember sitting in this chair, and I was told to close my eyes. He has a gift for me. And I remember I remember sliding over in the chair to make room because I thought for some reason I was getting, like, an inflatable Easter bunny with a carrot. Like, I literally thought this. Uncle Meg, I thought I was getting an Easter bunny. I have no idea why. I have no idea why. But I remember, close your eyes. And I'm like, okay. And I literally just 
moved over, made some room for that Easter bunny. You know what I'm talking about? Like an inflatable Easter bunny with a carrot. There's supposed to be a picture there. There's supposed to be a picture there. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about right there. I had this in my head. So I'm sitting in the chair. He goes to get the gift, and I just made some room for that thing. Well, shockingly enough, it wasn't an Easter bunny. It was like a painter's hat from like Hilton because his kids went to Hilton. It was like plastic and cloth and like had all the ads of everybody. So it was like free and cheap and it's all good. I mean, I was working with him, so sure. Protected my head from all the nastiness in those houses. I don't know. But I just remember sitting, making room for that thing. So Easter 2020, here we come. There's a story in 2 Kings about a widow who's in trouble. And uh, she looks to Elisha, the prophet, because she has no money. She said, the creditors are coming to take away my sons. They're going to use them as slaves. What do I do? And so Elisha said, send them and gather all the pots you can. She had told him she had just a little bit of oil left in the house. He said, go and get all the jars that you can collect. He didn't say, just go and get as many. He literally said that and then repeated himself, don't just get a few. Make room for abundance. Don't just get a few. Because when all the pots came back, that oil filled up every empty pot. If she had five, Guess how many got filled up? Five. If she had 10, 10 got filled up. If she had 100, that oil just kept flowing, just kept going into all the vessels. If she had had 1,000 empty pots, those pots would have all been filled by that oil, by the supernatural working of God. Make room for abundance. The vessel you give God is the vessel he's going to fill. So uh, Jimmy told me not to do this, but we're going to try it out. Just to add, we're almost done, I promise you. The vessel you give God. So some of us have literally made ourselves available like, like this. Make room for abundance. Enlarge our territory. God, the fears, the insecurities, the doubt. I see it happening in my life, the things that God's changing to make room. I see it. And can I just warn you, sometimes it's painful. It's good pain, but it's painful. But it's growing me, and I see that. Remove this. Like, God, enlarge my territory. Do what you got to do. We want to make room for abundance. And so for some of us, literally, what, now, mind you, the power of God. <laughs> Y'all just got real nervous. The power of God is unlimited. So right now, like, you're all thirsty. I could, I could help you out here. <laughs> Feels a little hot up here. Like, I could, I could help us out. I could cool us down. Like, not just us. Like, hey, Greece, watch out. Like, we got all the water we need. But that's the power of God. And so for some of us, we've literally just made ourselves available this much, and, and this is it, and this is really all we can handle. Like, we, we barely make it to Monday morning. Where God wants to enlarge and make room because as he enlarges me, as he enlarges you, he enlarges us. Make room. So for some of us, we've literally given God this much where um, God is like, hey, the bills are coming to town. Let's go Buffalo. <laughs> and he just wants to start filling you, right? Oh, oh, there's no... There are no cords here. But here's the next level for some of us. Like, hey, this has been really good. But now God's like, let's go. Make room. Make room because the vessel that you offer to the Lord is the vessel that he's going to fill up. Now, now, here we go some more. Like, hey, if I just keep going in Jesus, like somebody could take a bath in the spirit of God with me. Because of the vessel that I made available to Jesus, enlarge our territory, enlarge our influence, enlarge our vision. You've got 
to get to a point where you can share it. You got to get to a point where it's like, oh, there's way more for me than this. There's way more for me than this. We've got to get to that point. Enlarge me, Jesus. Make room for abundance, New Testament. God is going to fill you as you just make yourself available to him. But it's not just for you. It's so that we can share him because his word says, his final thing he shared with us is go and tell somebody about me. Go and tell somebody about me. Enlarge our territory. Enlarge our territory. Do what you got to do, God. Do what you got to do. So could you pray for me? Because in the next two weeks, I'm meeting with the principal in Greece. My dream is to, I already coach in the school system. My dream is for us to be in our schools because we need help. But I'm naturally limited. Like, obviously, I can only do so much. But I, I like the things that the enemy tried, I can't even get enough jumpstart teachers in my church, let alone how are we going to make an impact in our schools? Enlarge! My territory, Jesus. Enlarge my vision. Enlarge our heart. We have a prophetic call over this church to be a pivotal voice in the city of Rochester. We have a call on this church to be a hospital and a healing place. And in the natural is like, huh, what? How? Huh? Enlarge our territory. Enlarge our heart. New Testament, God is doing something, and I want to be a part of it. God is doing something, and I want this local church to be a part of it. That we are going and telling people about Jesus. As he enlarges you, and he enlarges me, he enlarges us. So if you are with me this morning, enlarge my territory. Would you just stand with me as we end? The Bible says, ask of me, and I will give you, not just your town, not just your school. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. As we were worshiping this morning, I was brought to Habakkuk. For the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. The whole earth will be filled with the glory, and he gets to use us. So I just want to pray with you this morning as we leave. If you would just, if you're comfortable, just lift your hands in a receiving position because God wants to give you more. We're making room for abundance, but he wants to enlarge us. So Jesus, here at New Testament Christian Church, our prayer together, we understand what it means, enlarge our territory. Each and every person here, Father, enlarge their territory. Lord, thank you that you're enlarging our vision. Thank you that you're enlarging our influence. Thank you that you're enlarging our spheres so that we can make an impact. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with you, that all men might know who you are. Enlarge our territory, Jesus. We just thank you that every word you've spoken over us and over this church is coming to pass. Here we are, surrendered and available. We are sliding over, God. You don't have an Easter bunny for us. You have more power, your presence. You, I thank you, God, that you're getting what is in us, out of us, to those around us. Enlarge us, we pray. Make it clear. We thank you that you are removing every fear, every insecurity, every excuse. Gone. You're greater, God. So we thank you for that. We thank you that Rochester doesn't know what's coming in the name of Jesus. We thank you for that. We thank you that you're giving us ears to hear this week, God, ears to hear your voice. We thank you that you're giving us eyes to see you moving around us. God, we're going to take the opportunities that you give us. We thank you for that. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Have a great day, New Testament. If you need prayer, we have a prayer team that wants to pray with you. But have a great day. Happy Sunday. Jesus loves you. We love you too.